Education will definitely, as we also move, um, not watch while we're diving, but uh, listen to your, uh, your, your part. So what's going to happen now, we're going to into the LCT clinic. And this is where we're going to focus, uh, take our focus a bit deeper into work integrated learning, where we have two uh, supervisors and four uh, PhD students at different levels in the doctoral journey, and they will now share their experiences. The format of this clinic is each um, participant will introduce themselves, where they, just to create some context. And then um, we will talk more about our projects, our challenges, and um, yeah, also invite input from the online audience. Oh, this is going to be a headache. Okay. Can I just say that we also have one online participant, Ms. Luala Daris. So, Luala, if you want to just unmute and uh, put your camera on when we get to you. Well, now my left and right. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're ready to go. Um, sure. And over, this is the order that we'll go in. I'll hand over to the first participant. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Shen Hollis-Turner, and my field of expertise has mainly been in the field of business. I've been situated in the Faculty of Business and Management Sciences. Uh, how I got involved with LTC was with great encouragement from my supervisor, Professor Wernberg. In 2011, I commenced my doctoral study, and I was looking particularly at the knowledge bases of the current and our recurriculated three-year diploma in office management and administration. Um, and I found that LTC was a great tool and aligned with my research objectives. And I also wanted to align this with the broader aim of looking at employability of our graduates. So the Delphi, um, I also use the LTC to guide me uh, with my research uh, technique because I then uh, I had a panel for Delphi surveys uh, compiled of graduates, academics, uh, and also I had employers, as well as I used 113 students, a third year students, documentary analysis going back to the commencement of the programs in 1970 and interviews with local and international academics. So I used, my first dimension I used was the autonomy dimension. And this was related to um, who decided on the knowledge base of the curricula. Uh, and this really it was quite an interesting study for me because I had to go way back and look at right from the beginning at the historical data, minutes of curricular meetings, advisory board meetings where we brought employers in, interviews with academics. And all of this led me to discover that the curricula, the current and the recurriculated one, the one that we were busy with, the new one, uh, were both definitely PA positive and RA positive. Academics had been in control of the old curriculum uh, uh, because they were recontextualizing the needs of the field. We also did not have a professional body, so this meant it was all in the hands of the academics. But also, with us becoming a university, the demands were such now that our heads of department had to have uh, a doctorate. And we found that often what happened was these people did not have experience in the field, but were the ones um, guiding the curricular principles, as well as faculty management, who were passing down directives that we have to standardize uh, certain of our syllabi. So these all um, enforced the uh, positional and relational autonomy of PA positive and RA positive. 
The next I mentioned I used was semantics, and this was to look at my research question, what knowledge areas are drawn on in the development of these curricula? And what we found was that, you know, this being a very much a vocational program, that it was SG positive and SD minus. And while this is common in vocational programs, we did identify that there is a, was a problem in the sense that we were pushing so much technology in our program, you know, information technology skills, at the expense of a strong communication foundation, which therefore was something that we had to take on and look at as a big problem. But this was also reinforced because, you know, one of the strong semantic density components, density components were communication, accountancy, and uh, some of our legal subjects. But um, as I've said, these were the ones that were now being, really being told how to be standardized, which of course then did not give a strong semantic density component that we required. Uh, a stronger foundation was needed in business communication, rhetorical and discursive practices and genres, which would have been, you know, there to provide a strong foundation for these curricula. And then the third dimension I used was specialization. And uh, this was to align with my research question, what attributes are implied by the current and new qualifications for the role of office management office managers and administrators. And it was very interesting now listening to what Karen was saying about um, the epistemic relations and the social relations. Because in our case, um, the findings were strong on the ER negative and SR positive, because the OMT graduates have characteristics that are associated with NOAA codes, with the cultivated gates. And um, you know, office managers, administrators need to be generous. They are serving other people. They're supporting others in their positions. So this is the strong NOAA requirement. Uh, but there was, of course, there's knowledge codes um, in the syllabi of our program, but they were not pushed to a high enough level. I mean, finally, um, what were the challenges? Well, the main thing for me, I think, but that I found took the longest time and the most amount of uh, headaches <laughs> was the translation devices for semantic gravity and density. Um, we basically had a program, a three-year program of 16 syllabi, and there were two of those. And we had to, I had to go through all of that to look at, you know, what were the strengths, what was the strongest semantic gravity, what was the uh, strongest semantic density. And that took excessive amount of time, uh, but was worth it in the end, because from that we got a clear semantic wave, which showed the cumulative knowledge over a period of time. Uh, so all of it was absolutely worthwhile, and um, uh, I found that most useful, and it's been still being used in our department to see how progress can be made. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. We now move over to our next participant in a supervisor role, Draft Penelope Inoyo. Hello, everybody. So to keep going with uh, the, the questions that we're asking ourselves uh, so that we, we put a picture together and then go into discussion, um, I'll try and be, be quick. And how I got into LCT, well, I have to turn to Chris Winberg um, and the Professional Education Research Institute, which uh, we're celebrating 20 years of that uh, research at uh, CPUT today, as well as, as participating in LCT 3.5. And Chris introduced us over time to many um, theories, frameworks, and then, of course, with other expertise in the world. And so a big thank you to here to um, Professor Ari Rip, because definitely, uh, although LCT wasn't the particular framework he introduced us to, in the basket um, was he, he introduced us to many others. I first used it um, when working on a curriculum post the Fukushima incident and looking at uh, the medical curriculum at Fukushima Medical University. And we were trying to understand how to 
move forward um, with, with a changed curriculum in, in the kind of new world that that um, presented to, to Japan. And um, LCT became a really important um, tool for that. And then in supervising um, Liesl's study together with, uh, with Prof. Winberg was the other time that, uh, that I've, I've used it. Um, and the, the dimensions really initially um, semantics uh, in, for the Japan study, um, for, for Liesl's uh, work, which I, I also sit in that um, professional domain, so in, as a radiation therapist, and um, we started with specialization, <coughs> perhaps heard this morning, those of you that attended, but were encouraged also to look at, um, at semantics and in particular epistemic semantic gravity. So I haven't yet used autonomy. And, uh, and of course, that's something that I've read about. And within Perry, the really nice <coughs> that exposed to others using LCT. And so we kind of learn from each other and we absorb, um, we absorb a lot about LCT because of talking to each other, presenting to each other, hearing our students. Um, so, so that's really, really great. Um, so then just to, to say a little bit about challenges, I think I sit in the health sciences and we very clearly ask the research question and then we decide how best to answer that question. <laughs> so, um, so for me, it's always a, you know, can I set off saying I want to use LCT? Uh, before I've even asked a question, and it's sort of in my mind, no. But um, I ask the question, and then, then if LCT fits, you know, it, it's it's a good one to use. So I kind of I, I just put that out there as a little bit of a uh, of a challenge in sort of where I come from personally. Um, and then also the other challenge for me, so talking broad challenges rather than challenges, as Shan has so nicely captured for for the use of LCT. Um, so I'm not, not going, but I share all of those with her, like the translation devices and so on. But, but another sort of uh, challenge, I think, for looking at myself personally, and then looking at introducing and pulling in new researchers and, and, and other postgraduate students into the, the world of LCT, um, do, there's a challenge in, should they just get on and do it, you know, or should they know something beforehand and it is that whole knowledge knower thing and and where where do you start and and it is a bit of a debate for me um we were all just went in at the deep end when we started but now there is some more kind of uh knowery stuff going on and knowledge stuff going on um in our group and so as others come in how, how do we help them and i think that is a is a challenge as we as we carry on um, and of course, uh, I, I guess none of us are real experts yet. I mean, I just think LCT is uh, complex and it's got, yeah. it's got lots in it. And um, there's just more uh, than certainly I can get to grips with. Thank you for this conference. Uh, it's great because it, it helps us. And I'll end there and pass on to Liesl. Thank you, Prof. So it's my turn. You, by now, you all know me. I'm a student of past student from Prof. Winberg and Prof. Engelhilds, and I was introduced to um, LCT in the Peri community, but I had a choice. I could just use the threshold concept framework, or I could use this powerful tool to really um, show other things, and I, I use other because I'll come back to it. And I was in, immersed in this local community where we had meetings, writing retreats, roundtables. We started off with our own roundtables and that's really where I've learned to talk the talk and also where I've developed my understanding and in a way my contribution to, to um, this community. On an international level, I've presented both at the 2017 and 19 conferences. And again, there the input, the, the comments, the engagement, it just really expanded my my liking into into this this community and it's not i'm not selling the theory i'm selling community because if it's not for the community 
the theory will just stay at that level of abstractness that we struggle to, to, to work with and that we really struggle to operationalize. And again, I'm coming back to that. And the fact that we live stream here today, we on social media, yes, I've joined all those pl platforms, but I infrequently check them, but I know it's a go-to place. If I need to go and quickly find something, I know where to go. So it's also, it's not only a community, it's an easily accessible community as well. And before I go on to how it was used in my thesis, you've heard last night how it was used. Um, I presented my work on PhD celebrations. I want to touch on the challenges because from these challenges, a lot of opportunities arose for me. From the terminology, I always got it wrong. And then I had to make a concerted effort to really read and to, to know the words and how they fit in. Because if you want to make a contribution, you want to make a, a proper com contribution. It's not only your discipline and your field and how you build knowledge in that field, but it's to, to grow the LCT knowledge base as well. And then also my biggest, biggest challenge was which dimension to use, when to use it. And I think when you go back to what you've read and what you've written and what you've presented, the key for me was being clear on what is my focus and what is the basis of legitimacy. And that is something that I think because I'm an insider in what I've written and to no disrespect to my supervisors, they knew the field. And that's where I think um, the, the comments and, and the critiques, the, the very, now I can say very positive and constructive critique was maybe because we were such insiders that we didn't really see the opportunities that epistemic semantic gravity can bring. And that brings me to how I, I used it. My, I was in love with specialization <laughs> from word go after I've been used. And I just, because I, I grasped it, I, I, I grappled with it for a long time, but then I finally knew um, what I could do with it. And then I had to change slightly because as I said, uh, somebody else looked at and maybe saw my focus and my basis was not sufficiently covered by specialization. So then um, I really wet my toes in epistemic semantic gravity, uh, yeah, ESG. And as Prof uh, Penelope presented this morning, that really it showed me what the threshold concept framework, yes, what it had, but also what it missed for what I was looking at and what, not what I wanted to see, but what was happening in practice, not only in curriculum documents, but what students experience, what clinical staff experience um, while students are there. And that really brought the curriculum to life because ESG allowed me to, to sort of put, quantify um, skills and quantify competencies. And after that, coming back to my second major challenge, was my um, translation device because if that translation device um, it allowed me to 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 talk from theory to to my uh, results or my findings and also back again but um, what we saw in practice and and what our students go through while they're in the clinical practice that really ESG assisted us to to do that so um, to, to wrap up. Uh, I can't say I hate the translation devices, but coming up with or developing, because in both, using both dimensions, I had to develop, we had to develop uh, translation devices. It was difficult to start off with. It was difficult. You can't just add a number to a concept or a thought. What, where does that thought come from? Where does that concept come from? Because only if you have that right can you really read the device from left to right and right to left. Because what does theory tell you? What does your empirical findings tell you? And that is something that uh, in both dimensions, the translation device illuminated to me. Thank you so much. I now hand over to John. And after John, Luella will join us online. Okay, thank you, um, Liesl.
Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am John Adams from CPUT, um, lecturing engineering graphics and design in the Faculty of Education. Uh, Professor Winberg, on my left, is my supervisor. Uh, I'm quite new in my research, so bear with me. <laughs> um, in short, I spent all my teaching years in technical school education and made a short turn of five years at uh, technical college education. Um, one of the most common criticisms of uh, FET colleges is that its curricula are outdated, both in terms of theory and uh, learning theory and their relevance to industry. Um, it is apparent, therefore, that the reform of the curriculum is a major challenge. Um, my research is to design a curriculum framework for the alignment of engineering graphics and design with its occupational standards and uh, industry uh, needs. The assumption is that when these concepts are well aligned, it makes the student leaving the institution more uh, employable. Um, I was introduced to LCT by my supervisor as part of my research. Um, but well, being a novice in this field, I think at this, at, at this time, or I need to focus more on getting to learn more about uh, LCT. Um, sitting through the presentations of LCT in this conference uh, are very helpful to get a sense of what LCT is or really is. Uh, the presentations of the PhD students last night uh, were very encouraging, uh, especially the advice never to give up, uh, to keep on keeping on till it's done. So yeah, that is my contribution um, yeah, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Luwala, if you want to unmute and start your video. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and thank you for this opportunity to do a bit of a presentation. So I'm Luella Darius. Um, I am a lecturer in the Applied Sciences faculty in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Studies, where I teach undergraduate um, environmental health students. So these students are enrolled for a four-year bachelor's degree in environmental health. So I was introduced to LCT when I had initial discussions with my now principal supervisor, Dr. Lalini Reddy, and Professor Chris Winberg about my idea of what it is I would like to explore in work integrated learning, um, which I got involved in in 2014. So part of what I do is to coordinate work integrated learning for the environmental health students. And initially, um, when I had the discussion, both Prof. Winberg and Prof. Reddy mentioned LCT, which at the time I thought meant learner-centered teaching. And I was petrified to find out that it actually meant legitimation code theory, which scared me even more because when I heard about code and theory, I thought I needed to be some sort of computer whiz to uncrack a code and to come up with something new. And I started reading about LCT and I eventually realized, you know, it is about cracking a code. And the code that needed to be cracked was, what do we legitimize um, in terms of, you know, what, what does it mean to, to understand, to know, to answer in terms of the different um, dimensions presented by LCT. So part of what I then uh, wanted to do is to look at using LCT to develop a tool to holistically assess um, the, what, what students learn in the workplace um, in environmental health. And the motivation for this was from the fact that much of the assessment is, is controlled, if I may use that word, by our, our professional board for environmental health practitioners. So all the universities of technology uh, across South Africa um, are required to comply to the requirements and the criteria for competence um, during the uh, auditing and assessment of the student uh, work integrated learning portfolios 
are that they have met um, a minimum number of prescribed days in a workplace, which in our case is 100 days, and that they provide evidentiary documentation um, indicating that they have been exposed to the different areas of the scope of practice. But after having read the reflective journals of the students and interviewing them during their work placements, I discovered that students learn so much more. They, over and above applying the theory and learning about um, how to apply technical knowledge, they, they see something else um, in the practitioners who supervise them. And one of the main things is that the competencies are so much more than merely uh, t applying technical knowledge and um, theoretical knowledge and that students realize that you know the other side is more important if I talk about the other side I'm talking about those softer skills so in terms of what I'm aiming to do is to look at what are the competencies that we should that we are missing and you know over and above making sure that students complete their number of days in a work setting what else do they learn so the students are seeing things and they are learning from their supervisors. And in terms of competencies, I am aiming to look at uh, or defining competencies in terms of my study as the knowledge, the attitudes, the skills and the values that unfold in the students that they acquire and that they um, use as part of a professional identity to be able to work competently. Um, part of what I also intend to do is to um, find out from the supervisors who in any case have a front row seat to seeing what unfolds in these students in terms of the skills and competencies that they develop um, to see how are they growing, what are they learning, um, what would you regard as a competent student at the end of their work placement um, and, and who is not competent. So a lot of the decision whether a student or competent, whether a student is competent or not is based on our professional board auditing the world portfolios at the end of the study period. And even if the student graduates, um, HPC, well, our professional board, who is a, a leg of HPCSA, decides whether the student will eventually be allowed to register for, first of all, the community service, which is a period of 12 months. Uh, followed by them registering as an independent practitioner. So, so much weighs upon this work integrated learning component, but we are missing competencies that they develop. And in a sense, we are robbing the student um, by merely basing it on this on a paper exercise and having proof that they have been exposed to, um, you know, the, the acts required by the environmental health practitioner. And then also, the literature on environmental health education is quite sparse. Um, and I need to also, I hope I'm not going over my time, but to distinguish between environmental science education and environmental health. So we have two legs in environmental um, education, and that is the one that takes care of the environment, and the other leg, which is environmental health, which takes care of the health of people in the environment. So in my literature searches, I have come across much that speaks to education um, in taking care of the environment, but not much that looks at taking care of people in a particular environment. And then just to end off is that um, those competencies, students, these students eventually, when they become independent practitioners, they have to uh, work with communities. They act as an intermediary between communities and government. So they are the first point of contact in most instances between very disgruntled communities and um, local government. And quite often they land up in situations where they have to manage conflict and they then need other skills um, um, and competencies and, and, and values that they need to um, hone in on in order to maybe diffuse a disastrous situation. So that's where I'm coming from. And then um, in terms of the challenges, um, the, the, the most challenging aspect for me was to get to understand the language and being able to use it. And my now co-supervisor, um, Dr. Liesl Hudson, 
quite often when we had our meetings would correct me because I became so confused between dimensions and codes and planes and clashes and <laughs> on all sorts of things. And I'm still learning about it. And I think um, now having listened to all the presentations that I've been able to um, and reading, it, it sort of sheds light, but I, I, I do feel going through that wave that everyone is putting on the screen about now I'm elated because I understand and then I lose it and then I understand again and then I lose it. So yeah, those were, were some of the main challenges for me. I think um, developing the translation device I could make use of the literature of others. It, it did help me a lot in developing the proposed translation device, which I have now learned um, will change as I potential as I go forward and analyze my data. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Luella. I now hand over to Prof. Winberg to. Um, okay. Well, um, I'll, I'll I'll be quick. Um, so how did I get into LCT? Well, that was um, a while ago. Uh, I was busy um, writing a chapter for a, 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 a book. Um, it was it was a Paul Trowler's book. Some of you might know it um, on um, uh, sort of rewriting Beecher's academic tribes and territories for the 21st century. And I, I was doing the chapter on mechanical engineering as a discipline. And the focus of that chapter was looking at, um, at, at a, um, a community-based project um, as a form of project-based learning. And I knew that there was something about in the interviews that I was having with the, with the engineers, there was something about this the way they, that they spoke about the, the, the um, service learning or community engagement uh, project, which was really highlighting things that were very typical of mechanical engineering as a discipline. But I didn't have a, I didn't know how to express it apart from just using my close critical reading and discourse analysis type skills. And then it was, um, a colleague at, at UCT in around 2010, the late um, Fuelan Shea, invited me to a workshop, which was, um, it was a, I think it was a three or four day workshop that was being presented by Carl um, at, at UCT. And she said to me, hey, you must come along to this workshop. Um, he's a really good guy. He'll, he'll help you with your problem. So I went along to this workshop and, and it was um, mind blowing to say the least. And I thought that specialization was the best thing ever. And it really, I could, I could uh, map um, how the engineers um, who belonged their home is in that um, uh, a knowledge quadrant and how uncomfortable they were moving into community engagement. So that's how I, I got it. And I think, um, and, and that chapter is, is, was published, it's, it's, it's in the book. And I, I, and I think it was, it was like really important for, for me because I, I, I just thought it was wonderful. I, I discovered how to use this, this new tool um, for, my, for my research. Subsequently, I think I've tended to use semantics much more and um, John, who was very quiet about LCT, um, has been using uh, semantics um, to look at the using semantics to look at the um, engineering graphics uh, curricula um, over over a three year period. And what what we've seen is because you know this specialization as Penelope explained earlier, it's a lens to see certain things and specialization and um, sorry, semantics really helped us to, to see why this curriculum is not preparing learners yeah. for the world of work. Why? Because they're flatlining mm -hmm. in at, at the top when we try to do a semantic profile of those um, uh, study guides, uh, assessment guides, etc. You just see it flatlining at the top with the odd dip down into 
uh, an assignment which might be more practical where they've got to do something you know which they totally have not been prepared for so um i think i i certainly in 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 my work have been using semantics a lot more it really and and it, it just becomes also a way of of un understanding the world you know when i i think about our um writing group i think that we have this writing group that we meet online for um what we call snack writing and i think that's that that's that snack writing is very deep level very um high semantic density and then um it's a sort of protected space where you can do this deep work um and then the, then you have to then you go out of the group and you You've got to find out about who's the audience that you're writing for and the journal requirements and all of those things and the gravity comes in um, yeah. one needs to escape into that um, space of, of high density so it's, it just becomes a kind of way in which i, I see the world <laughs> not just my own research um, the challenges and i must say i'm totally with you with the students the challenges are very much around um, the translation device in other words developing um you know the the translation device is what what uh bernstein calls the external language of description so we have in all the lct books etc very strong internal languages of description we understand lct but getting lct to talk to engineering graphics or radiation uh, therapy and other things that is where it, it's it's a real it's a real challenge and it's difficult for i think whether you a phd starting your journey or whether you you've published a lot and you're using it it's every every new project is a challenge and it's really difficult and so much depends on that that um translation device for the for the consistency, the logic, um, the way that you're progressing your argument, et cetera. Yeah, so I don't know if there are any questions that have been posed to us. There's one question and it's from Dita, just came after Shane's um, introduction. She says, I'm also looking three years worth of curriculum and have lots of data any tips for managing this wow <laughs> that's a minefield three years with and as you say lots of data from surveys i think you know all of us and especially the supervisors in here may know better than i do that it's keeping accurate records uh keeping having a system a data system prof winberg's been instrumentally teaching me not just about the data, but keeping literature review records. So all of that, because, you know, you, you do need to bounce that back. Um, the only tips, and I'm sure you're going to add, please do, that I would say is yeah, be consistent, be systematic, work constantly. Mm. You know, the minute you stop, you dip into the gravity <laughs> of the world, you're in trouble because it's to get right back in is, is very difficult. So... That's just my point of view, but I'm sure there's better suggestions here and, and more experience as well. Anybody else? Mm. And back it up. There you go. <laughs> Only thing I'll add. Back it up. We've all got stories of so what what systematic system and you put in place, yes. um, and then then back it up. I used to email my data um, to a department secretary and That's say to her, just file it, you know, in, in the days when we didn't have clouds. And things. That's right. Now we've That's got right. other, other options, um, but yeah. So true. Anybody else want to give Rita some input? I don't know, I, I think it's consistency, you know, um, my little experience since two years ago <laughs> is that don't leave your study for too long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To come back again. It's, it's, it's an effort. Yeah. So to work on it, you know, almost every day and to keep you going with your with where you're going to in any case. Just a funny story linked to backup. 
I was so paranoid that I carried a hard drive with me on a hike, <laughs> an external hard drive. We went to one of our uh, getaways and I remember it was James said, what have you got there? I said, just in case my one computer blows up, everything gets lost. Everything gets, uh, you know, you get so paranoid after a while. Yeah. <laughs> Keith, I'm sure you covered there from uh, storing to consistency to wear the hard drive with you. <laughs> yeah. um, any other questions from our online participants? You want to engage, you want to pose uh, recommendations or comments even to us, especially to the two new not new students, um, colleagues starting on their journey. Mm -hmm. I, think, yeah. I don't see any hands in that one. So that's about it. We have one member in the audience. No questions from. <coughs> um, well, perhaps I can just make a. Um, a comment, uh, because ev ev everyone in this group and Luella online, we're all working in the field of uh, vocational, technical and professional education. And I think that makes uh, particular demands um, on, 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 on this, both on the supervisor and on, on the candidate, because it, it's it's often about balancing these two worlds of academia and 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 work or practice the the, the profession, and so the tools. I mean, so the the tools. Um, you know, between this group, the tools that we've used are our specialization, which I think is really useful in underpinning the um, the the type of knowledge mm. that is. Um, so if, if, if you're looking at, 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 at what kinds of, of knowledge are, are, are useful in a particular context, but I think in a way our home is, is we, we have a better fit with semantics mm -hmm. because, because it is all about that um, yeah, yeah. sort of, you know, it been, it's been called many many things the theory practice divide you know yeah. it's it's about you know intellectual sure. versus mm -hmm. practical um it's it's all of those things and i think as carl explained so eloquently in his um opening address yesterday i think the thing that about lct that really appeals to us is that we're not put, put in a box because mm -hmm. Very, very often, um, I think because we come from a university of technology, uh, there are certain assumptions made about uh, about our, our, our programs, and they they're considered to be more low level or or not particularly challenging. Or, you know, there's, there's lots of preconceptions out there about uh, what uh, technical education, for example, in, in entails. And I think L L LCT has been such a, a useful set of tools for us and semantics in, in particular, because it, it, it just shows these continua yeah. Yeah, and, and shows that, that actually you're mistaken if you think that technical education is, right. is only about fairly low level of practice. <laughs> actually, it's not. There are these huge challenges of of very uh, theoretical scientific um, subjects, which you'd have to master in order to um, become a competent mm -hmm. practitioner. So I think for us, it's been, um, it's like everybody's saying, you know, once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Mm -hmm. So it, it does, it's re it really reveals the, um, both the strengths and the weaknesses mm -hmm. of our curricula and of our practices. We can, we can see very clearly using semantics. And if semantics isn't showing it clear, clearly enough, we can move to something like autonomy. Um, I think Sharon was one of the first um, of the doctoral candidates to use autonomy in, in, in a thesis. And that certainly started to show, yes. as you were explaining, how how those how the practitioners were being sidelined, um, even in 
in uh, vocational education and, and John sees it in the colleges, how the practitioners are sidelined and the those with more academic legitimacy uh, come in to make the decisions, even if they've never put foot in, in that, that field, particular that's right. practice before. So, so we, it, it is um, providing us with, a, with a, a variety of tools and a set of tools. I, I do feel that semantics is our natural, uh, yeah. is our natural go-to. And we, we wait for the other dimensions to be developed to see if they if they talk yeah. to us and 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 our practice as educators or as pra practitioners okay so i think that has brought us to the end of our um contribution to the lcp 3.5 and thank you so much for the engagement i really enjoyed looking at the chat and fielding the comments and questions um but this conversations will definitely go on. We are available. You can contact us uh, to take it further. So we are a bit early. Uh, I think we'll give you some time to just go and breathe yeah. before we start with the LTP Stellenbosch um, sessions. And thank you so much for watching and all the best to all the other groups that need to present. If you still want to. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. That's great. Thanks for, for the excellent work of chairing and fielding questions. Absolutely. It was, it was, well it was, it was great. And um, just a, a quick reminder, anyone who wants to join our, our writing group, send me an email and I'll send you the link. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. The organizing and the... And the yeah, thank you, too. Yes, your visual. Yeah. Before we say bye for, for last, I just want to say thank you to Amanda who really assisted us and also the two gentlemen from, from AV Direct uh, who, who helped us a lot. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Me, just to get <laughs> on the road and just to keep it on the road. So thanks so much. Yes. Bye, everyone. Bye. bye. Um, thank thank you. Over to you. Bye. In this session, we're going to look at LCT and community building. Members of the LCT community from around the world have given their views on what they like about LCT, what it's like to be part of the community, and what they use LCT for. What I love about LCT as an approach to research is that each concept 